Well, as you take your seats, do take out your Bibles, the inerrant, the infallible, the incredible Word of God. As we dig into this next handful of verses, we're going to pick up in Genesis 6 and verse 5, and we'll take down through verse 15. You know, people who don't know the Lord, people who don't want to know the Lord, people who believe that God doesn't exist, are forced to deal with a whole bunch of things that exist in our world that are inexplicable by natural means. And one of those is these incredible layers of fossilized material that exists all over the globe. And if you've traveled around much and been on as many continents as I have and looked at the world through the lens of truth, you'll come to a conclusion that at some point in time, this earth had to have been covered with water, including the mountain peaks. And in fact, when we're down in Peru here in a little less than a couple of weeks, one of the things that's remarkable is at the top of the Andes, in the very, high, very highest sections, are giant fossilized clams. They exist at an altitude of over 17,000 feet. And those mountains are supposed to be fault block mountains that were folded from some volcanic origins. And so it kind of indicates that maybe at some point in time, there were some giant things on the face of the earth. And in fact, those clams, some of them are well over three feet in diameter. Tonight we have the beginning of this incredible story that you can either believe is history or you can look at as fable. And so tonight we look at the reason or what caused this incredible flood, the flood of Noah. And so as we pick up in verse 5, would you join me and let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us through these verses. Father, we thank you for your word. And it is truth. And God, we admit that sometimes we have a difficult time reconciling in our minds the reasonings that you have for why you have done things that you've done, why you've allowed what you've allowed. And we admit and confess to you that it's hard for us to even imagine the condition of a world that would be so wicked is that you would look at it and see that there's no other choice save to destroy almost the entirety of not just the human inhabitants, but also the animals, all the vegetation, the plant life, which you took so much care to prepare as a garden for Adam and Eve. And so we pray tonight that you would speak to us from your word, instruct us from heaven, help us to rest and trust that the biblical record is true. We bless you, we praise you, we thank you for your word, in Jesus' name, amen. And so last time we looked and there's this race of giants that are created through what I personally believe scripture clearly defines as an angelic human hybrid race known as the Nephilim, the fallen ones. And it is after that, because mankind is not only depraved, but mankind is heading towards greater and greater and greater depravity. And it is that position that we begin tonight in. You have to look at the conditions of the world then, because our understanding of what lies ahead for all of humanity, through the prophetic word of God, is directly attached in the New Testament to what happens here. And so these conditions, combined with how Jesus illuminates these in Matthew 24, are the conditions that will directly precede the rapture of the church and the second coming of the Lord. And so verse 5 here in Genesis chapter 6, And then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. 
And I want you to stop for just a moment and think on the specificity with which those words are organized. Because it leaves zero doubt that mankind is verging on a time when one could say there's no remedy. If you're here tonight, you happen to be a medical doctor, you would bear witness to what I'm about to say. There are times when in medicine there is no remedy. Someone is so terminally ill that there is not anything that can be done for them. There's no medication, there's no operation, there's no amount of waiting. It is only a matter of time before that person will expire due to their condition. We call that a terminal illness, a terminal disease, a terminal sickness. In this case, mankind is terminally ill with such a sin-filled heart that there is no remedy. He can't come back from where he's at. And as hard as that is for us to imagine, we're going to see as this whole situation progresses that so pervasive is the condition of man's heart that there are going to be exactly eight people out of all humanity, potentially millions, maybe a billion or so by this time, but certainly a million or more people. Out of all of those people, there will be exactly eight people left on the entire planet that are not affected by that terminal disease in such a way that it is terminal to them as well. We have to keep in mind that God knows everything. He knows where we're at. He knows where we're going. He knows why we're going to go there. And he knows the end from the beginning. And so when God makes a decision, he does not do it capriciously. He doesn't look at it and go, well, you know, I'm just tired of dealing with this. And I don't feel like giving man any more time or grace. This is a terminal condition that has no remedy for those that have this condition. And so don't put evil on God when you think on this. Because some are tempted to place evil on the doorstep of the Lord. I say, well, why didn't God just take every last person who was heading that way and one at a time deal with them? That gives you an idea of exactly how deep and pervasive this sickness was because this was the only remedy. God would not have done what he is about to put in place were it not so serious that there was no return from it. It was the same exact example that we see and will see in the life of Pharaoh. Pharaoh's heart becomes so hardened that God, in turn, hardens the rest of the way Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh is not going to turn. He's going to continue going one direction. God knows that direction. So God says, if that's what you want, to spare the rest of humankind from you, I'm going to take you out. That is the condition of the world. Verse 6, And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth. And be careful again, hear what you assign to God. Of course, God knew he's sovereign, exactly what mankind would do, but he gives man choice. That choice validates the love relationship that he wants with man, allows for man to make the choice so that the love that man would give God in return would be real. But in this case, God is sorrowful. Much like we as parents, when we give our children some type of an order, we tell them, these are the house rules. You shall not do. You have created that child. That child is a part of the mom and a part of the dad. Amen? Recombination of two people's DNAs into a unique human being makes this new person called your child. You love that child to the point that you would die for that child. You do not want to punish your child. 
And yet, in order to save the child, the only option you have is to be very sorry that they're going to make a very bad choice. And while you do not make the choice for them, they will make the choice. You can still be sorrowful without being sorry that you made them. God is not sorry that he made them in that sense. He's sorry that they have chosen to do exactly what he has told them not to do. So again, be careful about the type of sorrow that you interject here. God's not upset. It's not like he's saying, man, I can't believe I messed up and made Adam. You know, I really did this horrible thing, and I'm really sorry that I created Eve. It's not it. He's sorry that he made man notice it on the earth. That the combination between the choices that man can make and the choices that man has made Then he says, it has grieved the heart of God. Because what God wanted was for man to, in obedience, say, God, we love you. We want to walk with you. And Adam doesn't choose that. Eve doesn't choose that. They choose to go their own way. And thereby, all of these things are set in in play. And so the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I've created from the face of the earth. When people look at that, they're like, man, I can't believe God would ever do that. What about grace, man? What about grace? What about mercy? What about forgiveness? What about turning the other cheek? What about, what about, what about, what about? The thing that we have to remember is God is perfect in all of his ways. And if he chooses to do something that we don't understand, it doesn't make him the author of evil. It doesn't make him mean-spirited. It doesn't make him less than just. It doesn't mean that he's eliminated man's only remedy. It gives you a sense of exactly how bad the condition is. Because God, to this day, desires that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of repentance, and yet all men don't come to the knowledge of repentance, and all men are not saved. God's desire is that we are. God's desire is that we do. But he leaves that choice in our hands. And so we have to be careful not to put on God what only belongs on us. What is mankind's problem? said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things, birds of the air, for I am again sorry that I have made them. Again, not that he made mistake, but the choices that man has made has come to create a sorrowful heart, just like the heart of a father, the heart of a mother, that says, I do not want to do this, but you've left me no choice. I don't want to put you on restriction. I, I, I don't want to take away, you know, the horror now. I don't want to take away your cell phone. But you've left me no choice. God is grieved. But I want you to notice the most beautiful verse that's contained in what we're looking at. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Not Noah was completely sinless. Would you please note that? Write it in your margin. Would you note that it does not say, and Noah was absolutely perfect and never sinned? Would you also note that it doesn't say that Noah was the only person on the face of the earth who ever did anything good before the Lord. It says one thing, and it says one thing only. And Noah found God's unmerited favor before the eyes of the Lord. God was going to receive from Noah love and care and concern by faith and in return 
God would give to Noah by grace, unmerited favor, that which he did not deserve. He would also at the same time issue mercy to him, not give him what he did deserve. And so the beauty of this is, what was necessary then during the time of Noah is still necessary tonight in order to have a right relationship with God, and that's to find grace in the eyes of the Lord. And that comes by faith. And interestingly enough, in the hall of faith, in Hebrews chapter 11, there is exactly one person in all the people mentioned who before his name is mentioned is faith, and after his name is mentioned is faith. Only Noah found faith, faith before the Lord gave him grace and exhibited faith after he found that grace. Noah, in that sense, was the largest of all of the examples of faith that we find in the Bible. So it was by faith that Noah received grace. Hebrews chapter 11, you can thumb through that. And it says in verse 9, For this is the genealogy of Noah. For Noah was a just man, Perfect in his generations, notice it doesn't say perfect in absolutely everything he did, but perfect in his generations, what he could do and what he could control and what he did do was seen by God as acceptable. For Noah walked with God. What was it that Adam was supposed to do? Walk with God. Adam chose not to walk with God. And Noah begat three sons. Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and the earth was also corrupt before God. You know, there's a defiling influence that humankind has on most everything that we touch. We can take good things and turn them into bad things. We can take wonderful things and pollute them. It is the choices that we make and the cumulative effects of them, so much so that we can actually corrupt the very things that God has made. And if you don't believe that, all you need to do is go to almost any river in the United States and you're going to find that it's polluted. Not because God polluted it, man polluted it. You're going to look up at the sky and you're going to go, I don't think that brown color is the color it's supposed to be. Not because God polluted it, man polluted it. You can look at the marital relationship between a man and a woman. Not because God made it polluted, but man has polluted that relationship and turned it into something it's not supposed to be. And so man has a history of taking things that God intended and made good and turned them into something that is not good. And so the earth was corrupt before God. The earth was filled with violence. Look at the accumulation, of these, the accumulation of these things. And so God looked upon the earth, and indeed, indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And the words here are striking, because it's not saying, as I said as we began tonight, it's not saying there's any remedy. It's cancerous. It's corrupt. It's going one way. It's going one way only. It's not coming back from where it currently is. And if left to its own end... It will suffer a very, very, very long time before it finally dies on its own. And so sometimes when the Lord steps in and intervenes in things that we would call uh, a, a difficult situation, He's doing so because of grace. He's doing so because of mercy. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them through people, humankind, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. And so this judgment of Noah, and we begin to look at why it is, and as we saw last time, certainly the, the Nephilim, these hybrids of angels and men, had something to do with it. They had taken of, of the women of the earth, and, and in that sense, um, had even genetically polluted the gene pool, because we already know that after these days, as we have already seen, 
We know that after the flood, there were the Anakim. Uh, there were another, n- a number of other groups of people. The, the Raphim were also giants. So there were, there were a number of remnant peoples that even existed after the flood. So mankind, in, in that sense, uh, suffered from that consequence. But that couldn't possibly be the only reason that God now decides to wipe out the creation that He so carefully crafted. There had to be something else. There had to be other things going on. And and while the primary cause may well have been that this abomination had occurred, as we saw last week, Peter speaking to us from 2 Peter in the book of Jude, Jude writing to us as well, God didn't spare the angels that sinned. God took care of those angels that left their first estate. He did all of those things. One of the ways that we have to look at this is we have to start looking at Scripture and compare it to Scripture. Whenever you want to get a definitive answer as best as we can get an answer from Scripture, if you find something you don't understand, go someplace where you do understand what it says and look and see how those things compare if they're a like type thing. And so in this case, comparing Scripture with Scripture, 2 Peter chapter 2, there in verses 4 and 5, If God didn't spare the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment and not spared the old world, but saved Noah and the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing bringing a flood upon the world of the ungodly. If he did all of that, Peter will go on to say, well, how shall we escape? Are we better than those that were on this earth before uh, the great flood? And in fact, it's interesting when you begin to look at mythology in general, when you look at uh, Greek mythology, you, you can look at even here First Nations people, Native Americans here in our own country. There's all kinds of stories of giants. There's all kinds of stories of evil beings. There's all kinds of stories of kind of half men and, and half some other you know, created being. And so it's not unusual for people to understand that somehow between heaven and earth there's an interaction. The question becomes, what are you going to do with it? Greek mythology is filled with kind of evil gods, if you will, who cohabitated with people. Zeus was rather famous for it. You see, we have to kind of decide, are those things kind of freakish myths or those may be truth that's filtered into some of the myths that are being told on this earth to this day. And I happen to believe that they're actual truth that has been hybridized and made into myth instead of myth that's been made into truth. In other words, that all peoples have an understanding that somehow the supernatural interacts with the natural world. But what else is there? Couldn't possibly be that God decides he's going to wipe out the world because of some genetic mutation. It couldn't be that one of Noah's sons was so bad that he was going to, you know, be uncontrollable. Because then you run into, well, why didn't God just wipe out Seth? Why was he ever born? You, you get all kinds of questions that are also unanswer- an, unanswerable. What else is going on? The scriptures actually tell us. It wasn't just bad, you know, angel and human DNA. It wasn't that there were only giants who were men. And remember, it says nothing about women of renown. It just says men of renown, and it actually means male. So there weren't just simply a bunch of giants who were men. Doesn't even make any sense. So there isn't a natural answer in that sense. It's supernatural. There's something going on in the supernatural world. Notice verses 5 and 6. What else was it? And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart. In other words, man began to be incapable of actually thinking about anything other than evil. Now, I don't know how twisted you have to be that your thought processes are so evil that the only thing you think about is evil, but that is a demented soul. 
That's, that is someone, I personally have never met somebody like that. I can honestly say, and I've met some pretty crazy people. I've been in some very strange situations. I've been in some situations that I fully believe the person that I was dealing with was demonically influenced, if not possessed. But I can tell you, I was still able to have conversations with that person at some point in time. I never have talked to a person whose thoughts were continually and only evil. And so what's in view here is, is something very different than I think our world has again seen. But I can tell you this, we're starting to head a direction that I think could get there someday. To where mankind becomes so twisted in his thinking that his thoughts are always on things that are ungodly. His thoughts are always away from the Lord. His thoughts are never, because remember, God's definition of evil and our definition of evil are two different things. God's definition of evil is that which is not pleasing to the Lord. And there's a whole bunch of things that we would not call evil that are not pleasing to the Lord. So this is God's definition of evil that's in view here. It's injustice. It's inequity. It's hate. It's anger. It's bitterness. It's everything in Scripture that is defined as the fruit of the flesh gone completely amok, running absolutely rampant and wild. It is a world that is, in essence, exactly as Scripture says we ought not to be. So there's something very different in view here. It's terrorism. It's thinking about doing things to other people that we can't even fathom as, as the children of God. It's getting to the place to where that, oh no, please don't do this, that comes from God's lips and is supposed to land on our ears, is no longer landing on our ears. The mankind isn't hearing the word of the Lord. There's no more preaching of the gospel. There's no more righteousness. The world doesn't want to hear about it. So when you hear people talking about, you know, if we really wanted to solve the world's problems, we should get rid of Christians. That is a very dangerous thought process. Because it is the Holy Spirit and the life of the believer that is the chief influencer of the world towards righteousness in the Lord. It's not government. It isn't law. It's Christians. So what's in view here is a world without God in the Old Testament, or in our time, a world without Christ. So when we say we are beginning to see the effects of living in a post-Christian world, that is actually what's going on here. A godless world. A world that never thinks about God. A world that doesn't care about God. A world that doesn't want God's opinion on anything. A world that doesn't seek God. A world that could care less about what God thinks. So when you have opportunity to be an effect in this world for the Lord, you are actually thwarting this very thing. Because people stopped doing it except for eight people on the face of the earth during the time of Noah. Now, I think about the number of people that we have in this room, and I would imagine none of us are really, you know, sign me up, I want to go down that road. That's not going to happen. Me, personally, I'd rather die. I would rather lose my life than go that direction. Because I've lived without God. And there's nothing on this earth that's worth going back to that. You see, God doesn't really need to repent, as the King James seems to indicate here, much as he said in the life of Saul there in 1 Samuel 15. It's not that God is, you know, needing to change direction. He, he still created man with the right attitude, the right heart, with righteousness, with capability to do the right thing. But he's, he's saying, look, man's going to go this way. I have to honor his choices. 
One of the things that we get involved in is discussions about God's sovereignty and man's responsibility when we think about this. Because what you really have here in view is can man thwart the plans of God? And the answer to that is ultimately no. God is God. But does God allow man to make decisions that makes it look like man can thwart the plans of God? The answer to that is yes. Because you can choose to do things that are completely contrary to the will of God. And God will let you do them. Not because he hates you, but because he loves you. And if he simply forces you to be righteous, then you don't love him. He's just made you into a robot. He's told you, this is what you have to do, and you have no choice. So God does allow us to do exactly what he doesn't want us to do. That doesn't make him the author of evil. That means that he loves us so much that he gives us the choice to really choose to do good. And though God was very kind in putting Adam and all the rest of us into a perfect world, and he had been marvelously long-suffering. Remember, this is not three weeks after the Garden of Eden. This is perhaps a couple of thousand years after the Garden of Eden. And so it's a long time. Man's had a long time to go the wrong direction. And you think about it in the, in the sense that we understand time ourselves. Look at what's happened to mankind since the early 1950s. Look where man is today compared to where mankind was 60, 70 years ago. When I was born, we still had a census bureau in this country that would determine, you know, how many people were around and all those kind of things. And so we kept track of fairly minute details on human beings on pieces of paper. Now we don't do that anymore. We have biometric information and ge genetic information and a database with your DNA. We have all kinds of things. It used to be that somebody came to your house and you actually filled out a census report. I live in such and such a street and there's three kids in the house and the whole thing. Now you're being stared at from a satellite in space. Think about evil. Television was in black and white. Color didn't come until the early 1960s, and then only if you were very, very rich. Your television weighed about 800 pounds, <laughs> was in your living room, and when you turned it on, the lights went dim in the whole rest of your house. I don't know how many of you remember, you remember those push-button remotes that, that clicked when you, you know, they had three buttons on them. It was like eight, ten. We had four channels. San Diego County, when I was growing up, had four channels. I have four channels of ESPN <laughs> and another 5,000 channels of whatever. And 4,899 of them are garbage. Amen? Amen? Yeah. They're evil. There's an awful lot of stuff on television that you would have been thrown in prison for in the 1950s and 60s. You would have gone to jail. So when you think about, well, you know, God wasn't fair. Oh, mankind can get ugly quick. And you see what was happening was the church in the world was affecting the world for the church for the better part of 2,000 years. And then all of a sudden something turned. 1962, prayer comes out of schools in the United States. By the end of the 1960s, we are in the sexual revolution. No-fault divorce becomes the law of the land. The breakup of the institution of marriage. Pornography becomes legal. It was illegal when I was in high school. 
and from there to the environment that we live in today. It can get bad really fast. Don't kid yourself. You see, when the evil starts compounding and affecting other evils, evil begins to snowball. I believe the last days started right around the time of Jesus. The only thing that I believe is that we are in the end of the last days now. Because as it was in the days of Noah, that passage we looked at last time there in Matthew 24, Jesus responding to the question asked him, let's face it, mankind's still on that path of destruction. Mankind has not moved on from seeking to do its own will in spite of what God has told us he wants us to do. That is not about Nephilim. It's not about demons, because demons can only control those whom yield to demons. If you're a believer and you're here tonight, you cannot be possessed. Because light and dark cannot cohabitate together. And if you're a child of God, you cannot be possessed by a demon. You can be oppressed. You can be pushed in from the outside. You can be depressed because you haven't sought the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the power of the Spirit to help you with that fight. But you cannot be possessed. The only people that can be possessed are those who willingly do not want the work of the Spirit in their life. So when that begins to become the whole world, guess what happens? Evil begets evil. It gets worse and worse and worse. And the things that we can think up. If you do a quick history of what the world looked like uh, back in the time of Christ... If you look at from about 500 B.C. to about 400 A.D., you're going to find some inhumanity to man that's pretty hard to understand. The Assyrians were famous for taking poles and sticking them along the side of the road and impaling people on them only partially so that while they died and writhed in agony, they would slide down that pole until finally it would come out the top of their head. That's pretty sick and twisted. But here's the sick part. Only a few million people died. Now we take babies who are in the safety of their mother's womb and destroy their lives before they ever see the light of day. Which one's worse? If God created life and he's the author of it, you see, we're quick to point towards the Carthaginians. We're quick to point towards the Medes. We're quick to point towards the Romans. We're quick to point towards the Greeks when we won't look at what's going on in our own world right now. And praise God, grace is the answer to those things. It's always been the answer. It was the answer for Noah. It's the answer for anyone tonight that's struggling with sin. Notice God's answer, and I love this. Noah was merely saved by grace. Now, in the truest sense, did Noah believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? As you and I would say, no, he believed by faith that Messiah was coming. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Very plain statement here. There's four things involved in it. Notice what they are. He found grace. In other words, it was a gift. He didn't earn grace. He didn't work for grace. He wasn't so much better than everybody else that God gave him something because he was good. He found grace. It was a gift. Very same thing that is available to us today. For by grace you've been saved. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. You've been saved by grace, through faith. It is a gift of God. It's not of yourself. None of us can boast about it. Noah found grace. 
Noah didn't find works. Noah didn't find religion. Noah didn't find a plan to get his life right. Noah found grace. It was the only way then, it's the only way now. The result of that, you see, if you find grace, here's what happens. You're justified by the grace of God. So because Noah found grace, Noah was a just man. Noah was justified. You see, this is New Testament salvation by grace found in the sixth chapter of the first book of the Bible recording events that were before the flood of Noah at least 4,000 years ago. You see, Noah found grace, and because of the grace that came to him by believing, he was justified. He was declared to be righteous. He himself was not righteous. He was declared to be righteous. It says Noah was a just man. And because of this, he was perfect in his generation. What happens to you when you confess your sin? He is faithful and just to forgive your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What does it say? Been made perfect. In the eyes of God, God doesn't see your sin. God sees perfection in Jesus Christ, your Savior. You see, Noah experienced a type, if you will, of salvation by grace and through faith. It's exactly the same way that anyone and everyone has ever been saved. His life, and it's interesting, that word complete is, is unique because it means in totality, but in that sense, he's talking about his generation, it, it means his life revolved around God. In other words, because Noah found grace and because Noah was made just as if he had never sinned, because Noah in that sense was perfect in his generations, the reason he did that is because his life revolved around God. When he got up in the morning, he was thinking about God. When he went to bed at night, he was thinking about God. What happens to us when we give our lives to the Lord Jesus, all of a sudden our lives become centered in Christ. We become God's kids. And then finally, what happens to you after that? You begin to walk with God. That's the process we call sanctification. All of a sudden, Noah's mind is turned towards the things of the Lord, and anywhere God's going, that's where Noah wants to go. So Noah is really a type of our salvation. It's a picture for us. He found grace, he was just or justified, he was perfected in his, in his righteousness in his generations because his life revolved around God, and because of that he began to walk with God. It's an incredible, beautiful picture. Notice there's no church, there's no religion, there's no thing that Noah had to do. Noah found grace. It's still what we do to have a right relationship with God. We find the grace of God. We find His sovereign mercy working inside of us. And let's face it, can you imagine? Think about Noah's life. The dude, as far as we know, he was a preacher of righteousness for at least 120 years. We're going to see some additional details as we continue this story. But think about his life. Get this, imagine this for just a second. The guy preaches with his life every single day, and as far as we know it, he leads eight people to follow God. Out of all the peoples in his neighborhood, on the face of the earth, those who watched him build this humongous ship, which was basically a floating box, by the way, in a land where it had never rained, in a place where there was no sea, wasn't next to a lake, Noah believed God. So how was Noah made right? He found God's grace because he believed God, he was justified. And because of that, his life revolved around God, and because of that, he could walk with God. 
So when you think of the story of Noah, think of it in the context of what we know now in the completion of the plan of salvation. So when you look at Noah's life there in Hebrews 11, 7, he's the only one that begins and ends with the phrase, by faith. The only one. All of them have faith to some degree, but his begins with it, his ends with it. Unfortunately for mankind, because Noah was forgiven, Noah was faithful, Noah was fruitful, all these things. That's still our model. But unfortunately, people don't like that model. People want there to be some other way. I pray that's not you tonight. God's now going to kind of proceed to rehearse this destruction. The earth was corrupt before God, filled with violence, looked on the earth. All flesh had corrupted its way. He's using these terms to where we understand, look, it was, it was beyond remedy. There, there was no way it was coming back. The universality, if you will, of human wicked, wickedness and depravity had reached its apex to the point that God finally says, look, I can't save it. It's terminal. No amount of continued time going by was going to make it so that it would it would get better. I think most of us have bumped into somebody in the age of grace that's like this. You may know somebody right now in your life that they're going the wrong way and they're going the wrong way so hardcore that you can honestly say, man, unless a miracle happens, there's no coming back from that. That's why it's very important that we don't live lives of sin as believers. It, it's, we cannot pollute ourselves. Mankind, in essence, had finally destroyed themselves. It wasn't God. God simply solidified the choice. God simply said, that's what you want, and that's the direction you're going. I'm going to let you have exactly that. I want to encourage you when you're talking to people and they say, well, you know, I don't think God's really, a, you know, he doesn't have a problem with this. And it's in direct contradiction to what the word of God says. You need to remind them that God is gracious. He is patient. He's long suffering. He's kind. But that patience and long suffering and kindness has its limits. And you don't know where the turning point is. It's one of the great tragedies of people who live lives of sin who claim to know the Lord. You, you don't know when you're going to cross over to where there is no remedy. You, you don't know when you're going to finally just so impact your own thoughts with sinful behavior and sinful thinking that you go over the edge. Please don't do that. In Jesus' name, Resist the devil, and he will flee. But you have to resist. You can't cave in. You can't say it's okay. You don't get an opportunity to be on both sides. And again, I, I, I remind you, I point you towards Paul's admonition in the first chapter of the book of Romans. That first chapter closes with, Beware. Because these things are coming upon the sons of men and those who approve of such things. Even the approval of sinful behavior can lead to a place to where you now have that mindset yourself. It's a dangerous place. Don't go there. It can be fatal spiritually. I'm not telling you that I know for a fact in your life that you've reached that place. I'm just saying, don't mess with it. I don't think that most of the people on the earth during Noah's time were sitting around going, man, the Lord's going to wipe us out. Yay! I believe they were thinking that there was another day for them to continue their behavior and that they were somehow going to escape it. And in fact, we are told that they believed they were going to escape until the day 
that God closed the door of the ark. Don't let that be you and don't let that be anybody you know. Don't play with it. It's not worth it. Finally, God had had enough. You start to assemble all that the Bible has to say about those times. Because remember in Matthew 24, there in the beginning of the chapter in verse 3, Jesus sits on the Mount of Olives. So he's on the Mount of Olives directly adjacent to the Temple Mount. Um, He is speaking this discourse that we call the Olivet Discourse because of where it's happening, which is the Mount of Olives. The disciples come to him and they say to him, they're in verse 3 of Matthew 24, what will the signs of your coming and the end of the age be? In other words, what's the world going to look like? And Jesus answered and says, take heed that no one deceives you. You see, the world is still trying to deceive. People who don't know the Lord are still trying to deceive. Satan is trying to deceive. Demons are trying to deceive. The world system, which is run by the enemy, is trying to deceive. And if possible, your Bible says, even the very elect of God. And so to that end, when you begin to cumulatively gather together all the things that Scripture says about what it looked like in Noah's time, there's a few other things that are said in Scripture, and I want to give them to you. Remember, you can download these from the Internet, so you don't have to write all that fast. They'll be posted up, and you can pull them off with the Scripture references. Save you a whole bunch of time. Number one, Luke's Gospel says there was a preoccupation with physical things. Oh my goodness. Has there ever been a world that was pre, more preoccupied with physical things than the world that we live in? And that's all kinds of physical things. That's comfort, that's luxury, that, that's the tangible, in other words. You ever wondered why we've created so many different ways to appease our humanness? Luke 17, 27 reminds us that. We've already seen in Genesis chapter 4 that there was beginning then rapid advancement in technology. Now for them, rapid advancement in technology meant better tools and farming implements and you know, probably the wheel and aqueducts and things to make their life easier. My goodness. I got serious technology on my wrist. That's an Apple Watch. This thing can, I can order dinner, I can pay for that dinner, I can call Uber, I can talk to it and text you. Now for those of you a little older, remember Dick Tracy? What was the one thing that he had that everyone wanted? The talking watch. This thing does it. I literally can talk to my watch and call you. I can call Siri. Now, I'm only telling you that because when I was born, computers did not exist. There weren't any. They came about in the 1950s in their earliest form. The one that was used to put man on the moon was about half the size of the sanctuary. And it was a tape drive machine. It literally had paper tape on it with little holes. Now I have a watch that's smarter than NASA. <laughs> Notice, it's smarter than me too, by the way. The Bible says in the, last, the very last days, it's going to be like it was in the days of Noah, except on steroids. Materialistic attitudes and interests. Man, think about these things. Hebrews 11, talking about Noah himself, uniformitarian philosophy. In other words, things have always been the way they are. Things will always be the way they are. Things will continue forever as they are. We don't need to worry about it. Oh, really? There are some people that were alive in Noah's time that thought exactly the same thing. God's just going to let this go forever. 
might not be wise. We saw back in, in chapter 4, an inordinate devotion to music and pleasure and comfort. Now, I like music. music. I actually like to, you know, feel good. I, there's nothing wrong with that. And comfort. But look at our world. It's all people think about. It's like every day is please me, please me, please me. I don't even know if we can call music what it gets played today on a lot of airwaves. It's like you listen to that, it's like no wonder your mind is rotten. No concern for God, either in belief or conduct. We are living in the first generation in the United States of America that there are fewer believers in our generation than there was in the previous one. The first generation for that to happen. There are less Christians today than there were one generation ago. And we're not going this way, we're going this way. In disregard for the sacredness of marriage. We now live in the first time in this country where there are fewer people married than there are living together without being married. First time in our history. You talk to most millennials who don't know the Lord, they have zero intention of getting married. None. They want to know some of the reasons? It's not financially beneficial. I don't really know if I actually love this person. It's pretty scary. And again, that's not to say everyone is like that, but it's a direction. Rejection of the Word of God. Peter reminded us that in the very last days, people would just outright reject the Word of God. There are fewer and fewer Bible teaching churches that exist in our country and around the world. You want to see that in, in, in its absolute strictest form. The most Christian nation on the face of the earth used to be Great Britain. High 80 percentile of people profess to have faith in Christ. Not just in God, but actually in Christ. You know what that percentage is today? It's less than 30. It's going the other way. Post-Christian world. Population explosion. And not the right kind, and not the one that Paul Ehrlich wrote about back in 1973, in his book, The Population Bomb but the population explosion in undeveloped countries that cannot take care of the people, like China, India, and parts of Africa. Those children are being born, in, born into generational poverty. The Bible says those are the things that will happen. Widespread violence. We live in the most violent world that has ever existed. We, again, we think about Rome and we think about World War. We think about all these things. We lose more people to violence today than ever. I don't want to leave you bummed out here, by the way. General corruption in society. An example of that, our own Congress. I mean, look at the number of people and again, I'm, I'm not trying to mock. I'm, I'm literally saying it used to be when someone got elected to a position in government, they were of the highest moral character. It was demanded of them to be so. And now we live in a day and time where immorality is the general character of a vast majority of people who hold public office and they brag about it. They don't even care that that's the condition. And we're the good country. It's worse elsewhere. Preoccupation with illicit sexual activity. 
You think? You think? I'm still trying to figure out how to drive down PCH without actually looking. Massage parlor, massage parlor, adult bookstore. The other side of the street, the same thing. Hi, and I were going, you know, let's take a chance. So we're, we're sitting around, we're like, maybe there's a new movie that's come out that we haven't seen, it'll be somewhat edifying. We turn on the pay-per-view thing on our cable. R, 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 R. Cartoon, rated R. <laughs> and you look at the reason why. Filth, garbage, vomit, vulgarity, nudity. It's our world. As it was in the days of Noah, so it shall be when the Son of Man comes. Think on these things. Because there's still time. Praise the Lord, we're in the age of grace. Amen? Yeah. And I want to leave you with this. We are still in the age of grace. There is still time. There is time for us to do what God put us on this planet to do. And that's to turn men's hearts toward the Lord. But you know what? It's going to take a whole bunch of Noahs. It's going to take a whole bunch of Noahs. People who are willing to be ridiculed. People who are willing to be mocked. People who are willing to be scorned. People who are willing to never compromise the truth. People who are willing to stand up and say, I'm going to serve God, I don't care what you say. It is going to take a whole generation of Noahs to stem the tide. Because our Bible says, as it was in the days of Noah, so it shall be when the Son of Man comes. Those are the words of Jesus, by the way. That's not my words, that's His. So if we want to have a great deal of hopefulness, then the best way we can have that hopefulness is tell people about Jesus. To fight the good fight of faith, to remind people that there's a God in heaven who loves them. And that Jesus came into this world to prove to you, to prove to me, to prove to us that he loves this world. You see, God was speaking that message through Noah, but nobody wanted to hear it. And pretty soon, Noah's voice got drowned out by all of the rest of the stuff that was going on on the planet. And eventually, people couldn't even hear it. And because of that, it got so bad that there was no remedy. I don't want to go down like that. Now, the glory of the New Testament is that before that happens, we who love the Lord are going to be out of here. So in that sense, we got an exit clause in our contract. That trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ will be raised and we who are alive and remain will meet him in the air. So we're not going to go through the destruction of this planet ever again, you and I who love the Lord. But there are a lot of people, if they don't turn, they are going to go through that. And so let's make sure and be a bunch of Noahs. Be uncompromising, be unwavering, be on fire, be on track. Just be who we should be in Christ. The tragedy of Matthew 24 was this. They did not know until the flood came and took them all away. And the reason is, there was nobody speaking about God. Except for Noah and a handful of people. Let's not let that happen on our watch, amen? People often ask, you know, well, when do you think the Lord's coming back? I always say, I hope it's not today. Not for me. I'd be absolutely thrilled if the Lord called me home. But I'm concerned about other people. I'm concerned about this dying world, and we need to be concerned about this dying world. So let's tell them about Jesus, Amen. Pastor Alex is going to come back up. We're going to close in song. A few of the pastors are going to come forward and be available for prayer.
Man, do your best. Do everything you can to stem the tide. When you talk to people, tell them about the freedom that we have in Christ. That they can be set free and redeemed and cleansed and washed. Let's not let the world go. Let's not, let's not stop being who God's called us to be because it looks like it's too late. Look, it's not too late until the Lord comes. Amen? So let's tell them about them and make sure that they're not on our watch. Is the Lord going to come because we did something to fight back against the tide of evil that exists in our world? Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for your word. Lord, we admit that it, it seems overwhelming at times because the word, world is going the, the wrong direction. But we thank you that we have the answer to that wrong direction. And it's the right direction. It's to follow you. And we are so grateful for your Spirit's work in our lives. Thank you that like Noah, we found grace in the sight of the Lord. Thank you we've been saved by grace and through faith, been declared righteous. We're able to have our lives revolve around you and then walk with you. Lord, we thank you for that beautiful picture uh, of Noah's standing in you. We pray that each one of us would stand for you. Lord, that our lives would count for your goodness, your glory, and your grace. Help us to tell people everywhere and in every place about your plan of salvation so that men might be saved. Lord, the tide turned, the waters held back. Thank you for saving us. Don't let us flirt, Lord, with sin in our own lives. Help us to be emissaries for you. Wherever we go, Lord, would people know that you love them because they ran into us. We ask these things in the wonderful name of Jesus. And God's people all said... Amen.